Hi, everyone, and welcome to the NCAT webinar, Payments for Ecosystem Services Part 2, Carbon Markets and Credit Stacking. My name is Colin Mitchell, and I'm a Sustainable Agriculture Specialist at the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is kind of a mouthful, so most people just know us as NCAT. On today's webinar, we have two very special guest presenters, Debbie Reed and Jim Blackburn. So I work out of our Southwest office in San Antonio, Texas, and NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization established in 1976 that has six regional offices across the country, Arkansas, Mississippi, California, New Hampshire, and Texas, with our headquarters in Montana. Also, we have some staff in other states, such as Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Colorado. And we work on is issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I lost control. So our first guest is Debbie Reed, and Debbie is the Executive Director of the Ecosystem Services Market Consortium, or ESMC. ESMC is a member-based organization launching a national-scale ecosystem services market for agriculture to recognize and reward farmers and ranchers for their environmental services to society. ESMC members represent the spectrum of the agricultural sector supply chain with whom ESMC is scaling sustainable agricultural sector outcomes, including increased soil carbon, reduced net greenhouse gases, and improved water quality and water use conservation. Debbie's role in leading ESMC builds on decades of experience in agriculture, climate change mitigation, and sustainability efforts at the national and international level. Debbie previously led the Coalition on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, a na national multi-stakeholder coalition supporting the development of tools, support systems, knowledge, and programs to improve quantification of greenhouse gases uh, from agriculture. Our second guest is Jim Blackburn. Jim is a professor in the practice of environmental law in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Rice University, teaching courses in sustainable development and environmental law. He is also a practicing environmental lawyer with the Blackburn and Carter Law Firm in Houston and a Rice faculty scholar at the Baker Institute. At Rice, he serves as the co-director of the Severe Storm Prediction, Education, and Evacuation from Disaster Center, where Jim has been responsible for the development of landscape scale green space solutions for surge damage mitigation, including the Lone Star Coastal National Recreation Area, a web-based ecological services exchange and structural alternatives. Jim is a co-founder of the Texas Coastal Exchange, an organization that provides payments they come from donations and the payments go to landowners along the Texas coast for the sequestration of carbon on their land. Currently, Jim is co-leading a working group for the Baker Institute that is seeking to develop a new soil carbon sequestration verification protocol. And I want to give a thank you to NCAT, ATRA, and our IT staff at NCAT for making all this possible. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCAT's ATRA webpage and on our YouTube channel. ATRA, our sustainable agriculture program, is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service, and we're grateful for their support as well. ATRA offers a wide range of services to sustainable ag producers, including publications, toll-free helplines, and webinars such as this one. You can check it out for yourself after the webinar on the ATRA website, www.atra.ncat.org. If, if you have technical questions, don't ever hesitate to call us at 1-800-346-9140 or askanag at ncat.org. So there are a couple of th other things I'd like to point out before we get started. First, you'll see a question field on the screen where you can write questions during the webinar. We will be collecting the questions and we will answer a number of them towards the end of the webinar. Don't be shy about asking questions. If it is not answered during the webinar, we will answer it and all the questions we get via email in the days to come. In fact, if you think of questions after the webinar or about any sustainable agricultural question, look for the Ask an Ag Expert contact information on the actual website or take down the number and email at the bottom of your screen. Also, at the end of the webinar, you'll receive a short survey Please take a few minutes to answer the, answer the survey. It helps us make future webinars as effective and helpful as we can. And finally, I wanted to give a special thanks to Dr. Barbara Bellows of Tarleton State's Texas Institute of Applied Environmental Research and Southern Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education 
often referred to as Southern SARE. This webinar series is part of a Southern SARE funded research and education grant in collaboration with Dr. Bellows and the Texas Institute of Applied Environmental Research. We will be hosting part three of the webinar series on August 27th and will focus on water quality trading and wetland mitigation making. Keep an eye out as registrations will soon open. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Debbie. So Debbie, take it away. Thank you so much, Colin, and um, everyone in NCAT for um, hosting this and for, sorry, I'm forwarding that without meaning to, um, and, and for um, offering me the opportunity to participate. And thanks also to Jim Blackburn, my um, co-panelist. Um, I want to talk about ESMC and what we have been doing and where we are right now in a build out of our ecosystem service market in which we're bundling not just credits and assets from agricultural lands, but we're also bundling markets in terms of uh, our, our target market opportunities are multiple. Um, so I will start first with, sorry, a map in terms of, of what we're doing. So we're a mission dri driven, impact driven nonprofit organization. We're really uh, trying to create a hub in which all of the tools and the um, requirements to participate in a national scale market are available for both producers who are our suppliers, as well as corporates and other buyers interested in the assets. So we're investing in a national scale infrastructure for a market that is scalable and cost effective. Our mission is really to advance ecosystem service markets as a theory of change so that we can incentivize farmers and ranchers to actually generate ecosystem service impacts that society is interested in. We've seen a huge increase in societal interest in natural resource preservation and outcomes, but also greater interest in just how food is prepared, where food comes from, particularly in terms of who is growing the food that I am eating as a consumer and how is it being grown, both from um, a societal and consumer perspective, which is translating and transferring also to corporates who actually produce food. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because that's an important demand side component of what we're working on. We are um, developing and have developed an outcomes-based national scale ecosystem services market that is both conceived and designed for the agricultural sector. So we only work with working agricultural lands um, and agroforestry systems on agricultural lands. We don't engage in forestry or in other um, opportunity sets. We also designed and conceived the market to overcome what we see as existing and past challenges in ecosystem service markets, whether they are carbon markets or water markets, um, and spent a lot of time actually assessing what we uh, viewed as uh, challenge sets, if you will, in those markets before we designed our market. And then finally, we're really focusing on recognizing as well as financially rewarding farmers and ranchers for their impacts without operating in a manner that works for farmers and ranchers, we have no hope of actually creating a market that generates these outcomes. So for us, we're farmer faced, we're farmer um, farmer based and farmer facing, um, knowing that it's actually the farmers and ranchers who create the assets that are of significant, significant interest to society. We are often asked, how is ESMC different from other markets? I already spoke to how we're mission and impact oriented. The other thing we did is we have created protocols that are innovative in that they're tiered and they're modular. They're tiered so that we can address two current market opportunities that we found through a market-based assessment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, uh, a couple of minutes. But we all, our protocols are also modular so that when a farmer or rancher engages in our system, we quantify currently multiple bundled assets, so soil carbon, net greenhouse gases, water quality, and water quantity in one quantification approaches uh, approach that can create multiple credits that can then be sold, either bundled together to a buyer who is interested in the suite of credits or assets, 
we're separated. And in our pilots, where we're running across the country now, we have instances of both, where buyers are interested in the bundled credit, and we have um, a pilot in which there are multiple buyers of the different assets. We've also created our protocol so that different assets can be added over time. So we have already a, a request from our members, particularly the corporates, for a biodiversity credit that we will be developing in the future once we're actually up and operating at a national level. But for a very brief timeline, just to um, provide a little bit more context, we spent 2017 really doing a market assessment phase, looking at not just markets, but protocols, quantification tools, technologies, and assessing how to build a better mousetrap, if you will, if in fact we were designing it solely from the perspective of agriculture ecosystems, which are biological systems. What we saw is that most markets today operate around point source pollution approaches rather than biological approaches. So we have specifically designed the market um, for biological systems, which are in fact different. Um, and we know require additional flexibility. We spent 2018 focusing on market design. So we commissioned a market assessment and uh, started developing a business plan. But for what we're doing right now is we're operating in a soft launch that started in 2019 and really building out and testing all aspects of our market and our tools and our technologies, including our protocols. And we're doing that in a full public-private partnership with, with over 60 members. And I'll show a slide that speaks to those members. And we're doing all of this in anticipation of a full market launch in 2022. In terms of a value to stakeholders, um, what we're bringing to this space, if you will, is a national scale harmonized market dedicated exclusively to agriculture. I spoke to some of that, but another thing that we see in existing markets is a very disparate and often unconnected or disconnected market opportunities that really have prevented scalability um, within the market as well as within the agricultural sector. So our metrics, our enrollment opportunities, our purchasing opportunities, and our protocols are harmonized for a national scale approach. Whether you're participating in the Pacific Northwest or the, uh, the Southern Great Plains, for instance. The other thing is that um, we've de developed the market, as I indicated, for multiple um, market requirements. One of which right now, um, which accounts for about 80 to 90 percent of our demand, is what is known as corporate scope three greenhouse gas reporting requirements. And this is corporations who have taken on science-based commitments and other commitments to reduce their environmental footprint within their supply chains. Um, so for a food company, for instance, agriculture is a significant part of their supply chain. And when they take on commitments to reduce their emissions within their supply chains, they're really looking at reducing emissions within the, per, uh, the producers from whom they're purchasing credits. That is a huge market opportunity that we're working to meet the needs of right now. Um, the other market that we're actually uh, able to meet is the needs of compliance grade or voluntary carbon offset markets or compliance grade water quality markets. Um, and when a producer enrolls, we actually target them into one of those two market approaches since the actual participation requirements do vary. Another thing that we bring as value to stakeholders is we're, um, as I indicated, trying to create that hub where activity and investments occur so that we remove risk from the markets, we remove risk for both the producers and the, or the suppliers as well as the buyers. Um, and individual corporations and um, producers do not have to make all of the investments in the program. So we're taking that on. And we're acting as a, an agent of change, really, to help build ambition, both for the corporates, to help them understand that, yes, if you take on these ambitions, we can help you meet those uh, uh, annual reporting requirements for your shareholders, um, for your uh, uh, other consumers, if you will, but also building ambition on the agricultural side in terms of just bringing the tools and the opportunities to them um, to, again, remove the risk as well as the burden on farmers and ranchers. Um, I spoke about the uh, 
programmatic investments we made as well as the variable markets. The other thing we've done is we've made this flexible so that as the market requirements change, the standards in terms of reporting requirements for corporates, um, we can change with that and meet the needs of those companies. And we're actually in a phase right now where those market requirements are changing pretty dramatically right now. This speaks really uh, just a little bit more to those, the differences in those two uh, market demand sides, if you will. In both, we're creating assets, but the level of standards and the level of rigor required in the um, compliance grade and voluntary carbon offset and water markets is actually higher. So the cost of generating credits for that, the actual amount of data that needs to be collected is higher. And then the assets sell for more money. Um, in the, the corporate social responsibility or scope three uh, markets, there's less rigor required and less uh, burden, if you will, on the farmers and ranchers, and those assets actually do sell for less. But again, our system is created so that you can almost toggle between the two. Additional value to our stakeholders in terms of why members are participating with us right now and co-investing in the build out of this market is so that we can actually create a cost-effective market that operates at scale and meets the needs of all of the participants. Again, whether you're a buyer or a producer or an NGO who is really just interested in the impacts at scale. Um, ESMC is one of those NGOs, but we also have the Nature's Conservancy, the Wildlife Fund, and other NGOs who are participating with us. Um, so again, we're trying to do this all collectively so that we can achieve our mutual and overlapping goals in a marketplace. And um, the programmatic investments that we're making are not just in the infrastructure, uh, but also in improved tools to quantify either greenhouse gas or their outcomes so that over time we can continue to really improve the rigor of quantification and ver verification, um, which just brings more credibility to the marketplace. This slide just shows um, right now, uh, how we are operating, we have the e Ecosystem Service Market Consortium as well as a research consortium in which we are co-investing our members with the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research from whom we received a $10.3 million grant over three years to invest in the build out and to invest in the infrastructure development as well as the testing of the system. But we're also working with Gold Standard and Sustain Cert who are global certifiers that certify not only in ecosystem service markets, but for the um, Sustainable Development Goals 2030, as well as um, for corporate social responsibility reporting, so that all of our assets will be verified um, as well as certified. Oop, sorry, went too far. So this slide really just shows um, where we are operating to date, the um, blue stars on this show where we have launched pilots and are operating with pilots with our members. The green ones are pilots that are in the planning stage and the yellow are in earlier stages of development. But this slide also shows technically how our protocol is divided into 12 regions because the uh, quantification approaches and actually how uh, you participate as a, as a producer will vary by these 12 regions, which are based on both USDA land resource region boundaries, as well as crop reporting districts, so that we've overlaid climate as well as soil types and then production systems so that we can tailor within these 12 geographies um, the quantification approaches to be um, calibrated and validated for each of those regions. So that's part of the buildup that we're doing and we're testing in these pilots as you see on the slide. This slide shows our uh, members who, with whom we are participating right now on this market uh, build out. And I think the real takeaway here is one of the things we saw as a shortcoming in uh, current as well as past markets is that a lot of these markets came together without the entire market chain involved in developing the protocols, the tools, the market. So our attempt to overcome that is in fact to include the entire agricultural supply chain and value chain, whether it is corporates that are purchasers, if you will, of these assets, 
core production groups that are uh, among the producers, right, the suppliers of the assets. And but also, as I indicated, we have uh, conservation NGOs, we have land grant universities, uh, et cetera, both for the um, the research side of this as well as again the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve. And we feel this is a really incredibly um, powerful way to ensure that as we test this market, to ensure that it will work for the entire value chain and supply chain well into the future. So, thank you. That was my last slide. All right, now um, we're going to pass it over to Jim Blackburn. Okay, thank you very much, Colin, and um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm Jim Blackburn. And I want to talk today about the work we're doing at the Baker Institute uh, at Rice University and the Center for Energy Studies uh, in developing a soil carbon storage standard. Uh, and uh, our approach is, is similar yet different than what Debbie has described. So I think we'll get some interesting contrasts that are set up here. Our, our work started, I'm co-director of the Severe Storm Center, or we call it the Speed Center at Rice University. And, after Hurricane Ike came into the Texas coast in 2008, we received grant funding from the Houston Endowment to study lessons learned from Ike. One of the things that we learned is that the native ecosystems, the native prairies, the wetlands along the Texas coast fared much better in Ike than did uh, human habitation on the Bolivar Peninsula and some of the uh, land areas that were inundated by storm surge. And so in, in looking at that, we were trying to figure out from a non-structural standpoint, how to protect the uh, the large area that you see over here on the on the right hand image, uh, that darker area is 20 feet in elevation and below, and we we're trying to figure out how to protect that area. And what we quickly understood is that we're in Texas, and we're not going to regulate to get there. Uh, regulation may be a much more uh, viable alternative on the east and west coast, but in Texas, regulation is really a non-starter. But what we have found is that if we can talk value and price, if we can talk money in terms of talking about both climate change and talking about various types of solutions that would leave land natural over long periods of time, uh, we get a much, much better reception. I could talk with any audience in Houston about climate change and financial issues, uh, whereas if talking about it more from an ethical, moral standpoint, uh, I've lost many audiences in Houston, as you might uh, appreciate. So we were looking for how could we uh, basically take money from the urban area, uh, the six million people, the corporate uh, headquarters that are in um, Houston and Harris County, how could we funnel that money into the red area? Uh, the areas in green, by the way, are our, are our national wildlife refuges, which we have many of, but we have a lot of private property in red that was, um, that's basically undeveloped. And we're trying to figure out what ecological services uh, we might could uh, find a market for. And we looked at a whole list of them and carbon and carbon sequestration is the key market that we identified as being a, as, as being a possibility. So that really kind of sent us on a quest of both understanding and investigating uh, the market for carbon dioxide sequestration. And that led us to the 1997 Kyoto Protocol and the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, which is really where most of our carbon standards in, that are at, uh, at play in the world today, they, they originate from the CDM, which was really set up as an international process for transactions among countries and has become the basis for many of our carbon standards. But what we found out is those carbon standards as they're currently implementing really do not work well for landowners. Uh, we are here on the Texas coast focused on uh, working with the landowners. And there's just a lot of prohibitions under these regulations or under these approaches. Um, you can't participate uh, in, under some of these systems if, the, uh, if you're already making a profit and what you're doing makes economic sense and you want to layer or stack the carbon on top of it, that's prohibited under some of these protocols. If uh, more than 25% of your neighbors are practicing similar management practices, you're eliminated under some of these protocols. And if you're already uh, practicing good stewardship, you're also eliminated under some of these protocols. And 
and we, it just really wouldn't work for Texas landowners. So we set out to design a standard that would allow the creation of a viable market that landowners would participate in and feel good about, and that buyers could participate with credit. We've done this uh, standard development under the uh, flag, if you will, of the Baker Institute for Public Policy. It's a very well respected uh, public policy research institution in Houston associated with Rice University. And uh, we have uh, gone about setting these standards up. And what I'd like to do for the rest of the presentation is to talk to you a bit about the standards we've developed and how, they, uh, how we think they would operate. Now, in order to develop these standards, we also have created a working group of uh, various uh, stakeholders or interested parties. Uh, these are some of the participants that we have. I would tell you we have a very diverse group. Uh, uh, again, it's landowner centric. We have a lot of uh, landowner organizations. We have a lot of non-governmental organizations, Texas Parks and Wildlife, New Mexico Department of Agriculture are participating. We have a number of corporations and uh, there are more participants that are joining us all the time. Uh, the uh, the group currently has about 50 institutional members and about 80 individuals that participate in various working groups. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in learning more or per possibly participating, my last name is Blackburn. I only got eight letters in my email address at Rice. So I am Blackbur, B-L-A-C-K-B-U-R, at rice.edu. And you're welcome to email me if you'd be interested in, in participating. Uh, we believe that there is the potential to store up to a billion tons of carbon dioxide uh, in the rangelands, particularly in, in converted farmlands of the United States at $20 a ton, which is, a, I think, in the future will be a very low price. It's a $20 billion market, and we see that money coming to the agricultural community, or at least a, a, a large amount of it. And that's a community that we would like to help and work with. Now, under our system, the landowner is the starting point. We've set up a system that we think will work for landowners. And by having reliable measurement-based standards, we think it will work for the buyers as well. And so we've got to set up a credible system and we're in the process of designing the standards that will, we think, deliver that credibility and will work for both buyers and for the landowners. Now, the basic concept that we're working with is that credits are issued for soil storage of carbon dioxide in the form of organic carbon. Uh, basically, it is a carbon capture and removal concept. Photosynthesis is the capture mechanism. Photosynthesis captures carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, transfers it into the soil in the form of roots and in the form of uh, sugars and uh, carbohydrates. And that will build up over time if the land is protected uh, by the landowners. Uh, it is not that difficult of a system from a technology standpoint. The technology has been around for a long time, but it's technology that we've never really thought of like we do carbon capture and storage. And this is true carbon capture and storage. Uh, we really differentiate offsets from carbon capture and storage. And we think that soil carbon storage has been both um, kind of underrepresented in terms of its potential. And I think to some extent has been mischaracterized as an offset strategy rather than a carbon capture and storage uh, standard, uh, which is kind of where we're coming from. Now, a key to considering carbon capture is to consider the landowner and think of the landowner from a property rights standpoint. You know, if the landowners in the United States don't participate, if it doesn't work for them, it's not going to happen. So this billion ton uh, potential for carbon dioxide removal has to work for landowners. And in Texas, that means we've got to be consistent with property rights concept. We think that essentially carbon capture and storage in the soil is derived from property rights and is a property rights concept. Uh, basically, it's like growing potatoes. If you store some carbon in the soil, you can grow it. If you can grow it, you can sell it. That's sort of the key concept here. It's very much like any other type of agricultural product. Uh, and if you do put carbon in the soil, we believe that you have a right to sell it as part of your property right. Uh, from a landowner commitment standpoint, we're asking that uh, 
the landowners uh, basically not plow or otherwise have surface destruction. We want to maintain the ecological system that um, would be with native grasslands that would come from a good good stewardship of the land. It's voluntary. If someone does doesn't want to participate, they're certainly not required to. Uh, but if you agree to participate, in addition to no plowing or subsurface destruction, you've got to agree to maintain the natural system for 10 years for each transaction. And, and that's a very important proviso. If you look at the slide or the uh, chart on the left, uh, we we'll allow yearly sales of the carbon that has been stored. Each time a transaction is made, the landowner commits for 10 years. We, we uh, work with a lot of landowners to come up with 10 years. 20 years was beyond the horizon that many of our Texas landowners were willing to for, uh, commit to, but they were willing to commit to a rolling 10-year commitment, meaning as the market continues and each year they make a transaction, the 10-year commitment is renewed. So year after year, we have the 10-year commitment renewed. And in this way, we believe that with a vibrant market, we will easily have 20 to 40 years of uh, carbon storage uh, because this seems to be the major opportunity and perhaps the least expensive alternative alternative for carbon uh, reduction, carbon removal from the atmosphere that's out there. We also are setting aside a certain percent of the credits. In this slide, it's shown as 10% of the credits. We're still going through the risk assessment side of this uh, to make sure we have a buffer account to uh, be, be ready for any type of um, kind of unexpected um, but perhaps uh, reasonable to anticipate events that might have might lead to the storage being lost. At the core of our system is measurement. Uh, we believe that the carbon that is taken out of the atmosphere and put in the soil, we know that it can be measured. We believe that measurement is the starting point for a credible system. So as a starting point, all of our landowners must measure. Now, there are prerequisites um, that are kind of really not negotiable. Measurement is one of them, although we're working with a lot of different ways of approaching measurement. Uh, the Vera standard that's out there has an excellent measurement protocol developed by Steve Applebaum with Applied Ecological Services. Uh, that is a, the absolute default system. That is a, an excellent system. It is a an expensive system. Uh, the statistical requirements are very rigorous, and uh, that is a starting point. We're doing a lot of research, and hopefully, we'll do a lot of um, uh, uh, development of modeling and direct measurement techniques. So we think that there are real potentials for a lot of different hybrid situations, but measurement is at the core of what we're discussing. Now, this is a bit of a complicated slide that has five steps. In the first step, a landowner enters our program by basically raising their hand, saying they want to be a participant, and measurement is commenced on their property. Then an estimate is made about what the storage potential is of the land. I'll come back to that in a minute. Then at a later time, say three to five years in the future, a second measurement is made. That will determine the amount of carbon that has been accumulated over the three to five year time period between the initial and the second test. However, transactions are allowed on the basis of an estimate uh, made at year one, year two, year three, and that's shown by the small kind of triangles and that is an estimate that will be reviewed by the certification entity and that should be conservative. Um, the, the anticipation is with a conservative estimate, initial transactions can occur, cash flow can be initiated, uh, but at the point where the second test is done, an adjustment is made by either uh, paying for the additional carbon that has been stored or by uh, requiring the landowner to make up the difference, usually uh, we think in terms of probably working uh, or letting their land accumulate carbon but not being paid for it for the subsequent year or two. Uh, we believe that this is a workable approach, but it is centered on measurement. Uh, certification of these credits will be an incredibly important function. 
this certification process is um, basically being done by a new entity that we will be creating, likely to be housed in Houston as a 501c3 institution. Uh, again, cornerstone is sound science and impeccable credibility. Uh, we have talked to many of the existing certification entities and they really are not interested in certifying to a standard that they did not develop. And we understand that, appreciate it. And uh, so we intend to create our own certification entity and hopefully will be operational in 2021. Uh, we will, among other things, employ an excellent blockchain technology system because it is absolutely uh, just really non-negotiable that the credits have to be uh, kept up with. We do allow trading uh, in credits until they are retired and all of those transactions must be recorded and kept up with in a transparent system. The system that we're setting up is not only about carbon, uh, we anticipate that those practices that will lead to carbon in the soil, particularly the best practices for getting carbon in the soil, will lead to water resilience. Uh, it'll hold more flood water. It will take the peak off of a lot of our runoff. Uh, it will enhance water supplies. It will reduce water usage because the native plants are much better adapted. Uh, ecological resilience, uh, you know, certainly the prairie birds, which have been diminishing, uh, will be extremely well benefited. And the farming industry, the, rag, the uh, ranching industry particularly, will certainly have an economic resilience as a, as a result of this. Now, there are 10 principles. I know this slide is small, so let me summarize the principles very quickly. Principle one, the credits under this US system are issued for removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by photosynthesis and stored in the soil as carbon. Principle two, any landowner who sequesters carbon dioxide in the soil within a given calendar year is eligible for soil storage payments for that year. Principle three, transactions can be based upon estimated values subject to verification. Soil carbon testing is required for verification. Principle four, transactions may occur on an annual basis after an initial declaration of intent to participate in the soil carbon sales program and after the initiation of soil carbon testing. Principle five, to become eligible, a landowner must agree that the land will be maintained and protected in a way that promotes and protects soil health and landscape ecological health for 10 years. Transactions occurring in subject years, uh, subsequent years will require renewal of the 10-year commitment, creating a rolling 10-year requirement. Landowners are not required to manage their land in any particular fashion. However, we know certain techniques will yield greater benefits, and we believe peer pressure and peer, and peer success will actually become the dominant factor in, in adopted practices. A buffer account will be maintained to ensure that all credits are issued. That's principle seven, that all credits issued are in fact protected against failure risk. Principle eight, it's anticipated and specifically allowed that a third party entity can act as an assembler of the credits for purpose of expediting communications and exchange between buyers and sellers. Principle nine, all credits under the standard must be certified. And principle 10, all credits certified under the standard may be bought and sold until retired with all transactions being recorded with the certification entity. And that is the end of my formal presentation. I want to thank you for allowing me to come up and make this uh, presentation before you. And I also want to thank uh, Pink Muir, who helped uh, develop a lot of these slides, and Robert and Rather of Collective Strength in Austin, who's been our wonderful facilitator so far and has done a great job in helping pull this together. We will be issuing a white paper in the next few weeks that will go out to anyone who's interested, and we are wide open for input and ideas. And again, if you want to participate, contact me at blackbird at rice.edu. And uh, we just look forward to comments. And we think that this is an, a, a system that must be developed. And we're hopeful that we're on the right track. Thank you. All right, thank you to you both. Um, just to wrap up before we move to the Q&A, um, just a couple of reminders from resources we have available through ATRA. Um, Dr. Bells and I co-authored a publication on payments for ecosystem services that is available on our website. Um, 
last week we gave a webinar over the general topic of payments for ecosystem services and that part one is recorded and available on our YouTube channel. If you uh, search NCAT ATRA, one word, uh, you'll find us. And then just a reminder, part three webinar is coming up on August 27th. Um, and here is mine and Dr. Barbara Bell's email. Um, and let's go ahead and move on to the Q&A. got a lot of great questions during the presentations. And so we're going to kind of go back and forth. And we're going to start with Debbie. Um, can you speak to why the Western Range does not have a pilot program? And I'm combining two questions here. So why the Western Range doesn't have a pilot program? And none of the New England states are currently participating. What are the first steps necessary to start working with those states? It's a good question. So we're building out our protocols by adapting it um, for um, the soil types, cropping systems, weather, et cetera, and then um, major production systems. We've currently done the build out for six of the 12 regions that we have uh, scoped out that I showed on that slide. The next two regions will in fact be the Pacific Northwest. I'm not sure when we will get to the range states, um, but we're doing it right now in terms of two issues. One is, what is the actual opportunity for states to generate particularly soil carbon as a leading indicator, but then also additional greenhouse gas emissions, reductions, and then the water assets, and then member demand. And so far, the member demand has really been the driver. So we've uh, pretty much adapted the protocol and begun our pilots in the, that middle part of the country, if you will, moving next to Pacific Northwest and then California. And uh, we'll continue to do our build out geography by geography. All right, thank you, Debbie. And the next question is for Jim. Have you or the Baker Institute Working Group thought about regenerative agriculture and soil health improvement on a watershed scale so infiltration reduces flooding and thus develop a protocol so FEMA funds would be available to be used for paying farmers? Yeah, we're very interested in pursuing that. Uh, I believe that if, for example, in the Brazos River uh, watershed, which is on the southwest side of Houston, we have levee systems down uh, along the Brazos, about 30 miles of levees that may have to be increased in uh, elevation because of uh, really our increased concern about uh, rainfall amounts. If we could implement this type of system up the Brazos River watershed, we think we could probably knock uh, 10 to 20 percent off the peak flow during flood events by storage in the soil that would come from these restored ecological systems. Now that is a rough estimate that is not yet uh, verified by modeling. I have a, an agreement with the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority uh, where we're going to investigate looking into this con these concepts to possibly increase the availability of water supply during drought conditions as a way of bringing freshwater inflows to our bays which have no water rights now. So very much so the water related aspects i think are there i think fema might be interested i think I've, I've been told they are right now we're focused on just trying to get our carbon standard underway but we think there are tremendous implications for this with regard to both flooding and water supply right great thanks jim and then i have another question for you jim um, from the audience, how would investors receive an ROI on their investment into the program? Um, the investors, I mean, if you're talking about investors in terms of the credits, uh, I mean, they're, they're, the investors that we're talking about at the current time would be uh, those that are actually the um, assemblers of credits uh, that would be working with landowners. Someone has to pay for the sampling. Either the landowner would pay for the sampling or the um, investor or the um, assembler would pay for the sampling. Um, other than that, it's a transaction between the potential buyer by purchasing the credits that would be certified coming out of the uh, compliance uh, with the um, with the um, with the protocol. In terms of return on investment, um, I think the, the investment that we're talking about is twofold. One, the assemblers would have a, an issue about return on investment associated with the uh, money that they spend for testing. And that is a, a big issue. Front end costs will be substantial. 
and uh, there are various uh, kind of creative ways that are being looked at to try to try to fund that. But that's a big that's a big issue: the front end testing costs that are required. Uh, but if the buyers develop, or if the buyers uh, come along, and uh, every every indication we're seeing is that the interest of buyers in these alternatives is just getting. Uh, really more and more pronounced all the time, uh, particularly in the oil and gas industry in Houston. And uh, that's going to tip a lot of things in terms of the economics of making this uh, quite an attractive investment. Thanks again, Jim. And then this one's for Debbie. Um, so the Chicago Climate Exchange failed. How do you think the efforts of ESMC will be different this time around than the Chicago Climate Exchange? Yeah, that, you know, the Chicago Climate Exchange, I was actually involved and engaged in that. Um, and it was a great experiment and we learned a lot from it. It was a pilot project. And so not all of the due diligence was done and completed that needed to be done um, to actually launch a market. And I think that was part of the problem, right? So ensuring that there was sufficient demand, ensuring that there was appropriate verification and certification are some of the issues that were run into in that particular um, program. But they did do a great job of testing both the appetite of farmers and ranchers to participate, but also laid the groundwork for how you do quantification approaches um, that are robust enough and really started a, a lot of organizations thinking about how do we do a better job of quantifying changes in greenhouse gases from the agricultural sector um, before which there had not been a lot of work. So uh, there was a lot accomplished there that was fantastic. We um, spent a significant amount of time really investing in the due diligence pieces that, um, you know, in order to learn from that, if you will. Um, so I hope that fully answers the question. Okay, and the next question is for both of you. And this is kind of dealing with the issue of additionality. And would both of your programs uh, have payments available for farmers or ranchers that have already have their land in a healthy condition and thus have already built substantial carbon storage and water benefits? I can start. So um, in our program, what we do is we assess the baseline at enrollment through um, so carbon testing that is required every five years um, and then assessment of other um, systems based approaches. And then we quantify the changes in assets on an annual basis. So no, we cannot unfortunately pay a producer for past achievements, if you will. Um, it's really just a function of the market. We have done some work to address the additionality so that innovators and entrepreneurs can in fact participate in the market, um, which existing markets often prevent happening. Um, because we do know that the innovators, the, the entrepreneurs are the ones um, who really are trying to do things that are often quite successful and from whom their peers and neighbors learn. Um, so they can participate in our market. The delta on a healthy ranch or a healthy farm, for instance, if you will, the delta in terms of incremental or annual changes that can be achieved tend to be less less than um, a, a more degraded system or farmer ranch, if you will, that comes in. Um, unfortunately, that's not uh, uh, given the way that the markets operate, right? From looking at the delta or the change that is achieved after enrollment, um, we haven't been able to overcome that uh, in every uh, sense of the word, if you will. And if I may, just on the, the approach that we're taking at the Bakery Institute standard, uh, if you uh, at the time that you start measurement, if you can document that there is an increase in carbon going into the ground, regardless of what your past practices were, uh, you are eligible for participation under the Baker Institute standard. Uh, like I said, we believe that this is a property right concept, and if you are putting carbon in the ground, you have a right to sell it. We are not allowing to go back in time for the carbon that you've already put in. Uh, but from the starting point of uh, measurement forward, you can participate. In this way, good stewards of the land uh, that have been uh, practicing uh, regenerative agriculture, that have been uh, restoring native prairies, will be able to participate uh, uh, just like someone who has a degraded piece of land and, and changes practices. Uh, the amount of carbon going in will be whatever is measured. So 
we believe that it's a fair system that allows that. Uh, we think that to not allow someone who's storing carbon to participate is just fundamentally unfair. Okay, thank you both for those answers. Um, the next one is actually for both of you as well, and um, we'll start with Debbie. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, Jim. Um, can either of you describe the use of your system with a specific farm or ranch, and what had to be done differently? What were the costs in the timeline, and what was the credit or payment that was received? Yeah, so I can describe. We we started our um, pilots in the Southern Great Plains on 12 ranches um, in Texas and Oklahoma, and we've gone through the first full year of that program and are actually um, negotiating sale of assets from that, um, pending verification and certification. I would say the major things that we learned there uh, were. <laughs> For the soil carbon sampling, we use a three-inch getting soil probe. Uh, Jim showed a picture of it on the back of a truck. Um, because of weather events there, we actually encountered significant days, delays in soil sampling, so in some cases due to flooding and in some cases due to drought. In the flooding, it was too wet. We couldn't get uh, soil, soil core samples. And during the drought, it was too hard. We couldn't get the soil core sampler into the ground. So. It took us almost a year to actually complete the sampling on about 50,000 acres there, which was interesting. Um, the second thing is that in some states, we encountered in Texas in particular, we had to call, um, and this was work done with the Noble Research Institute, we had to call uh, the actual utilities to ensure before we dug uh, samples in every case that we were not uh, going to hit any of the infrastructure of the utilities. That also caused additional delays. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, the, the ranchers were great to work with, um, but our first intake form was developed without farm speak, if you will, and it was developed by modelers. So we were asking questions that took interpretation. So we have since done a complete revamp of the tool we utilize to actually collect the data from farmers and ranchers. But otherwise, um, I think it has gone quite well. We are working within our membership to determine the value of the assets and we have seen great um, responsiveness from our member companies to actually pay for those assets and hopefully we'll be able to announce that sale that first sale um, quite soon right Colin let me just respond quickly we don't have the same type of uh, experimentation programs that uh, Debbie's describing but we are uh, basically anticipating the first transactions uh, occurring in the not too different uh, or not too distant future and uh, we anticipate having essentially uh, uh, sample cases uh, where we will use case studies on these different transactions both in terms of the measurements and basically we'll share it with those that are participating uh, with the full uh, agreement of both the buyer and seller which at least right now seems like that we're on the way to doing now, that's not a transaction Baker Institute is involved in. This is a private transaction occurring outside of Baker, but using the Baker protocols as really a uh, pilot study to see how these transactions will work. But it will be a real transaction between a buyer and a landowner seller. That's coming. Okay, great. Thank, thank you for your both. And this is another question to you both, and we'll start with Jim this time. Um, will your certified program be certified by third-party certifiers with no conflict of interest? Uh, the answer is yes. We will be creating a nonprofit uh, entity. Uh, the funding of that nonprofit entity will be fully transparent. It will not be funded by any one entity. We're hopeful it will be funded by foundations to begin with. Uh, we are pursuing that funding at the current time. It will be set up as a standalone or as a uh, independent 501c3 with the board of directors that will be chosen for their diversity and for their, um, hopefully, uh, the, the kind of gravitas they bring from a credibility standpoint. That is our next major step is to move forward with this certification entity. We will be working on that this fall. Hopefully we will be ready to implement by early 2021. Yeah, thanks for the question. So in our protocols for the scope three market, which is the corporate social responsibility reporting, we are doing multiple levels of certification. We have um, self-certification, then we do 10% randomized risk-based um, verification ourselves. 
And then we're developing a second party verification program to ensure that there's no conflict of interest. For the scope one market, which is the carbon offset and compliance grade water quality market, we do require third party certifiers who are in fact trained according to ISO or International Standards Organization um, verification standards. So it's, it's tailored to the market requirements and standards. All right, thanks y'all. And this may be our final question. We may have time for one more. And it again is um, for both of you and we'll start with Debbie this time. Uh, what are the baseline assessment and ongoing monitoring and verification transaction costs factored into your valuation of carbon credits paid to landowners? Um, so I, I'm not sure whether the question is asking about our costs or the cost to the landowners, but currently the cost to the landowners are, as Jim pointed out, the cost of soil carbon sampling. Within our pilots, we are um, sometimes able to actually cover those costs with some of our collaborators and member partners. Um, but that is basically the major cost. And, and if in fact technical assistance is required, that um, has a cost associated with it. Otherwise though, we as an organization take on all of the quantification costs. So I, that's that infrastructure piece that I spoke to. Um, in terms of the verification cost, uh, that's one of the things we're working through right now is how much of the verification cost burden will actually fall on the landowner or the project developer or ESMC and can we take that on can we take on that burden for instance and create a bulk discount if you will so that's where the costs come in for the landowner um, our costs in, in entail the you know, you know development and maintenance if you will of the protocols the quantification tools and approaches and then the, um, generating the assets that will be sold. I hope that answers the question. And, and I would just say that uh, from our standpoint, I mean, Baker Institute will not be implementing this standard. We are creating it at Baker Institute. It will be handed off to, um, really, it, it would be an open source. It can be used by anyone. Um, the standard will be, uh, most likely implemented by companies that are what we call assemblers, uh, people that put together a group of landowners. Uh, I would tell you initial project selection is very important. If you can get uh, lands that are similar from a soil type standpoint that um, probably are flatter rather than have a lot of topography uh, that um, are you know in certain um, higher rainfall areas, for example, to begin with, they may help you be able to at least justify some of the initial cost and will keep perhaps your statistics down. We're trying to figure out the cost per acre of the initial testing. Um, if we could get it as low as $5 an acre, I think everybody would feel like maybe we're doing well. Uh, it has to get lower than that, I think, over time. But then again, we're talking about relatively low carbon prices. If the carbon price goes up, to $30, $35 a ton, then the cost of testing becomes a much less uh, much less of an issue. But at the cost of carbon at the $15 to $20 a ton range, uh, in that range, the testing cost is, an ex is a really big concern. Uh, the other cost will be the cost of the certification process, and we have yet to determine what that will be. Okay, and um, I think we have time for just one more quick one. Um, and this is about permanence, and this is again for both you and Debbie, we'll let you go ahead first. Um, how will you um, assure soil carbon will, will remain permanently secured? Will you have constant monitoring of soil carbon level in a sense in perpetuity or forever? Uh, um, Colin, were you asking me to respond first? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So we, um, we like, like Jim, we actually spent a lot of time talking to farmers and ranchers about what is your appetite for actually participating and engaging with us. And we have 10-year um, um, sign-up periods that we utilize with farmers and ranchers. And then we, as long as they're in the system for that 10-year period, we actually do monitor um, the soil carbon sequestration and the duration of that monitoring, if you will. We will do that for up to two 20-year periods. What we do know is it's it's related a lot to the practices and the systems that are engaged in. And uh, one of the things we're investing is, is in our tools 
to actually do a better job of monitoring remotely. So uh, satellite imagery tools and other tools so that we can actually monitor over time. But we will monitor for the extent of participation in the program, at least for the scope three. The requirements for monitoring in scope one may be higher, but we also have a buffer pool to cover any intentional or unintentional losses in the buffer pool. So we have multiple mechanisms, if you will, of addressing the issue of permanence because as biological systems, of course, permanence is really a, a misnomer in these systems. What we're talking about is residence time and duration of the soil carbon um, in the, the soil carbon stocks, and that's what we'll be monitoring. And, and I know we're short on time. I'll just throw out that we know that carbon can remain in the soil for a long time and the soil just needs to be undisturbed. Our 10-year rolling uh, requirement, as long as the market is, is strong, we believe that uh, we will have a, a great permanence with that 10-year uh, rolling commitment. The, um, the marketing requires the continuing, um, the market requires the continuing monitoring. We're in the process of uh, still developing these standards. It's an area where if someone has suggestions, we'd love to hear them about what we should do. Right, and that is all the time we have for questions. I know we got a, we had a few questions inserted there kind of at the end, um, and you know I get an Excel printout of all the questions, so I will pass these on um, to Debbie and Jim so they can um, answer them at their uh, convenience. And just thank you again to Jim and Debbie for your time and for participating. And thank you for everyone who, um, you know, asked questions. This was a really robust um, Q&A session. And, you know, again, thank you to Dr. Barbara Bells and to Southern Stair and everyone that attended. And have a great day, everyone. And thanks thank for you. having me. Thanks very much.